Welcome to the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association webinar. My name is Susan Shelley, and I'm the Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And we're so pleased that you're joining us here today. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook and you have questions, type them into the comments or the chat on those platforms. We will see them. We will pass them along to our panelists and uh, you'll get your questions answered. And if we miss one, then you can always email us info at hjta. Dot org. And you can find our website at hjta.org to answer all your taxpayer-related questions, and we will have all kinds of information for you today. I'm very pleased to introduce my two fellow panelists today, HJTA President John Kupal and HJTA Director of Legal Affairs, Laura Doherty. And we're going to start with John Kupal pre presenting a little bit about the threat to Proposition 13, the Taxpayer Protection Act. There's a lot going on. You don't want to miss any of this. John? Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. for. I know that a lot of people who are watching this are members of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. I can't stress uh, enough how important that is to us. Thank you for being members. Um, we're doing a lot. We're obviously California's premier tax fighting organization. I don't think there's much dispute about that. Um, and we try to fight in all the realms that we can in the legislature, in the courts, in the uh, in the realm of public opinion. Um, that's Susan's forte as vice president of communications. And um, this these quarterly webinars are uh, opportunity for you to learn what very basically what we're doing. We can't get into everything because we are engaged in a lot of battles right now. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple of the major threats to Proposition 13 and an opportunity. These are measures that will appear at least it appears now on the November 2024 ballot. But I would like to uh, leave the bulk of the time for this particular webinar uh, to Susan, who is our resident expert on the repeal of the death tax initiative. And the reason I think we need, need to spend the most of the time on that is because we are in the midst of trying to gather signatures. I know there are a lot of volunteers on this call right now uh, every every signature you get on the repeal of the death tax is very, very important. We need hundreds of thousands of, uh, of signatures, and Susan will get into that. But before uh, she does that, I'm, let me briefly talk about what's been going on in the political realm. Uh, the legislative session uh, just wrapped up, and there have been a couple of assaults on Proposition 13. One of them is ACA 1. Uh, it is Assembly Constitutional Amendment Number 1, which would seek to reduce the two-thirds vote requirement contained in Proposition 13 uh, for local bond measures and special taxes if the item being financed is infrastructure. Now, of course, infrastructure can mean anything, but uh, this is a battle that we have previously won fighting these proposals uh, that are introduced as proposed constitutional amendments in the legislature. We have fought these in the past and we have always won. Uh, oftentimes we prevent them from either, uh, from going to the other house. It start the, the assembly and would kill it in the Senate. Um, but this, this year is different. Uh, the long knives are out for Proposition 13 in many respects. Um, so ACA 1 cleared both the assembly and cleared the Senate which means it will appear on the ballot in November of 2024. And uh, that's the good news. And that is we But the one thing that we can claim, which is absolutely true, and that is ACA1 is a direct attack on Proposition 13. And uh, because it lowers the two thirds vote requirement and the two thirds vote is very, very important. Um, the other thing that needs to be addressed here is the something that we support and that is the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. This is something that is already qualified for the 2024 ballot. We along with the coalition of business associations uh, worked very hard to qualify that. The purpose of the Taxpayer Protection Act is essentially to close some of the loopholes 
created by the very progressive judiciary in the state of California. Um, it has transparency requirements. One of the main things it does that Laura is going to talk about is it closes the, the infamous Upland loophole, which she will talk about. But at its core, the Taxpayer Protection Act is designed to restore the protections of Proposition 13. The last thing that's going to be on the November ballot is something as tricky as we've ever seen. This is called Assembly Constitutional Amendment Number 13. And it is designed to be a dagger at the heart of the Taxpayer Protection Act. It imposes a requirement for any initiative that adjusts the local vote requirement for tax increases in a way that essentially would make it impossible for the Taxpayer Protection Act to pass. It would require essentially that the Taxpayer Protection Act, for the first time in California history, as a proposed constitutional amendment, would have to itself get a two thirds vote. Very tricky, very devious. My hope is that the voters will look at this as really gamesmanship and uh, will reject it. So those are, the, those are the three things, big things. As we approach uh, the election in 2024, we're gonna be talking a lot about that. But the most important thing right now for the purpose of this particular webinar is to have Susan talk about what the repeal the death tax uh, effort does and where we are in the qualification of that very, very important proposal. So Susan, I'm turning it back to you. Okay, well, I was gonna turn it over to Laura, but after that introduction, I think we'll go straight into it and then we'll come back and answer everybody's questions a little later. So the repeal the death tax initiative is a very innovative concept. We have a one page petition and what we are doing is we are reaching out to Californians all up and down the state through advertising, through email, through word of mouth, through all of you telling your friends about it. We are reaching out to them to print and sign the petition at home. This is a game changer, we think, because it's very difficult and expensive within the short time period that you have to collect signatures for an initiative. It's very difficult to get everything printed and out on the streets and signed and back. But this way, it's instantaneous delivery to everyone. And it's a very simple petition. So what we have tried to do is make this very simple and clear for everyone. So when you go to repealthedeathtax.com, and that's the link that we want you to give out to everybody, put it on social media, send it out by email, repealthedeathtax.com. When you go there, you will get a five-page petition like this and a five page PDF rather like this. This is the first page, this is the cover page. It says repeal the death tax. It says about this initiative, it tells you a little bit about what it is and what's in the PDF. And then a few more pointers about sending it back, making sure you double check a few things. And this is a mailing label that you can just cut out and put on an envelope. You don't even have to think about writing down the address. That's the first page. The second page, easy instructions. We've done them illustrated so that you can see exactly where all the things are that you have to fill out. Because you can sign the petition and send it back to us, but that won't be valid. It's only valid, it'll only count if you fill in everything. So it's your printed name and your signature, your street address where you are registered to vote, your city and your zip code. Up here, you write the county where the signers of the petition are located so we can take it to the correct county. So in this example, it's Los Angeles, but whatever county your signers are in, write that in. If you have signers who are in two different counties where they're registered to vote for any reason, people live across the street from each other and one's in one county, one's in the other, use two petitions because they check these at the county to see, is this a registered voter? And they check the county list, not the statewide list. So there's room for two. And then there's the declaration of circulator at the bottom. And the purpose of this is to attest that the person who signed it is really the person who signed it. So even if you signed it, you still have to attest that you signed it. That's what the declaration of circulator is. So you need your name, your address, the dates that you collected the signatures. And then, hold on, hold on, hold on. The dates that you collected the signatures. There we go. Sorry, I was hearing double sound. Okay, so here you have 
the declaration of circulator, your name, your address, the dates in which you collected it, the date that you're signing that you attest to it, the date, the city, your signature. And that's it. It'll take you 10 minutes and tell everybody that you know how easy this is. If you want to talk to the neighbors, if you want to talk to everybody, this is a flyer that we've included in the in the petition package. And this has the register to vote site where you can go to the Secretary of State's site. And if someone wants to sign, but they're not registered to vote, they can register to vote. If they're eligible, they can register right on their phone. There's a QR code. Below that is the check voter status where you can see how you're registered. If you're not sure if you used your middle initial or if you changed your address or you didn't, you can check right there your voter status. This is the website for repeal the death tax. And this is the support the campaign. If you'd like to donate, help us buy more advertising right there. It's uh, you can find it at repeal the death tax.com. Just click the donate button and you'll be helping the campaign. The next page is a new legal requirement for initiatives. This is the official top funders sheet, which shows who's paying for the signature collection. And a top funder is $50,000 within the last 12 months. But this is all being done on small donations. There's no top funder for this. So what it says is that the petition circulation is paid for by our committee, Repeal the Death Tax, a project of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Up here, it says valid only for October 2023. But that's just the funder sheet. That's not the petition. The petition goes all the way to January, mid-January, a little later. Uh, but this is only valid in October. And at the 1st of November, we will do a November sheet. At the 1st of December, we'll do a December sheet. So just go to repealthedeathtax.com and you can always get the updated one. This has to be shown to whoever is signing the petition. So if you're signing your own petition, you've seen it. It's in the petition package. And if you're showing it to a neighbor, just bring one of these along and show it to them or show it to them on your phone from the website. And then we have the petition. And the petition is one page. You can make copies of it. Just make sure you make the copies at the same size with the same top margin. It should work even if you have fit to page settings. This is a question we've gotten. What if it's actual size settings? What if it's fit to page? It'll work either way because we slightly oversized the fonts so that even if your printer shrinks it to 95% size, it will still be legal. So we're covered there if you're worried about these details. The top margin should be one inch or a little bit more. Down here, this is the official use only column. Don't write in this column that's to the right. Otherwise, don't worry that much about going over the lines uh, as long as everything is legible and clear and it's the address where the signer is registered to vote, we should be good. If there's anything wrong with it when we get it, we'll try to send it back to you if there's time so that you can do it again. And that's the petition. Now, what are we doing to get the word out? Well, we're doing email advertising. We're doing radio advertising. We're going to do digital advertising. We're doing events. We will be at the Long Beach Convention Center for the Apartment Owners Association trade show. John will be speaking at one o'clock. If you want to come by, tickets are free. Uh, you can get them, let me see, at the AOA website, aoausa.com, I think it is. You can click the link to register for the convention and get the free tickets. They're also having a toy drive. So bring an unwrapped toy, brighten somebody's day. Um, and then you can you can volunteer at our booth. You can sign the petition. You can hear the speech. You'll have a great time. We're also going to be at Taste of Soul in the Crenshaw area. That's on Saturday the 21st all day. Tasteofsoulla.com is their website. And you can come and see us there. We're going to have a booth. We're going to be collecting signatures there also. So we're doing as much as we can do we were just at the California Republican Convention collecting signatures, big thick stack of petitions. And we think that we're on a pretty good pace. We need more. We're always gonna need more. It's, it's a big heavy lift. The minimum number that we need of valid signatures to qualify is about 875,000. But um, we hope to get 1.2 million to make sure that we have enough valid signatures. Uh, and we want them sent back to us by January 16th. And then we will sort them and count them and put them in boxes for each of the 58 counties and start delivering them. So we need your help. We need you to spread the word, get it out there to people, repeal the death tax.com and hang on to those questions and I will come back to them. But first I'm going to turn it over to Laura, our director of legal affairs for an update on all the great work that our legal department is doing. Laura.
Did we lose Laura? I think you're muted. We can't, Laura, we can't hear you. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Laura, let me see if I have any questions. Let me get over here to this. I saw one question. Um, it was, um, what makes you think that the supermajority won't try to stop the repeal of the death tax? I think one of the uh, political uh, landmines we may might face is when the attorney general prepares the title and summary that it will probably be an unfair, uh, biased uh, title and summary, but we would be prepared to litigate that. Although the courts do provide some degree of deference to the title and summary prepared by the attorney general, if he's way out of line, we can get a court to correct it. But I think the question is, is well-founded. I think there are a lot of uh, powerful interests who do not want us to re reinstate this very important property owner protection of being able to convey property to your, your uh, children and grandchildren without triggering reassessment. This is a very, very important protection. And, and, and when Prop 19 passed, that constituted the largest property tax increase in the history of California. People did not know that when Prop, 30, uh, Prop 19 was on the ballot. So that's why it's so critically important to, to bring that um, protection back. And just to talk a little bit about the history of this parent-child protection, it goes back to 1986. Proposition 13 passed in 1978, and it said that your assessed value will not go up more than 2% a year for as long as you own your property. Well, when property was inherited, that counted as a change of ownership under the law. And people were losing their property because inflation was pushing up the values so high that when they inherited property, the tax bill would jump just as it had before Prop 13. So what the legislature did was create this parent-child transfer exclusion from reassessment, which covered the home of any value plus up to a million dollars of assessed value, the taxable value of other property. So that could be a small business, that could be an apartment building, a duplex, a vacation cabin, it could be anything, up to a million dollars of assessed value of other property. And that was passed unanimously in 1986 by both houses of the legislature. It went on the ballot. It passed with 75% approval. And now it's gone because Prop 19 erased it. So that's what we're putting back. We are not changing the other parts of Prop 19, the senior transfer three times to a new home without a tax increase. That stays. Wildfire victim protection. If someone has a, a tragic loss of a home in a wildfire, they can move to a new home, take their old value with them, no tax increase. We're not changing that. What we're changing is we are putting back what was taken away from you, which is the right for parents and children, and sometimes grandparents and grandchildren, to transfer property between the generations without reassessment and without a huge tax increase. And this is so important, not just for homeowners, but for tenants in apartment buildings. Because if you live in a building that's owned by mom and pop landlords, at some point when that generation passes and their kids inherit the property, it's going to be reassessed to market value. And that is a huge tax increase on an older building from the 70s, from the 80s, from the 90s, buildings under rent control. So they can't raise the rent. Maybe the rents have even been held a little below market all along because of good relationships with the tenants and the taxes were low, so it worked. Well, now the taxes go up. It's very likely that many of these buildings will be sold and the units withdrawn from the market, demolished for something else or some other use. So this is important for affordable housing and for tenant protection, as well as for small businesses like restaurants where people own the property and it passes to the next generation. And all of a sudden this business that's barely hanging on through COVID and everything else, all of a sudden, a huge tax bill that they never had before. And those businesses won't survive it. So what are we doing? Why are we doing this? There, one of the things that was sold to voters is that this would fund the state wildfire fighting effort. 
the state the state wildfire fund that was created by this. But John, tell them how that worked out. Uh, this did not work out well. First of all, the fact that the entire law was very confused is a reflection of the fact that Proposition 19 was not an initiative measure. It started out as an initiative measure, but at the last moment, some of the proponents uh, were getting pushback from other interests. So there was a, a last minute a negotiation and throwing in a whole bunch of different provisions. And this is what happens when the legislature tries to engage in important policy decisions in the last three hours of some legislative <laughs> session. It, it, it just didn't work. It, it just didn't work. The, the firefighters thought that they were getting a substantial amount of revenue into this specially created fund. But I was just notified by the Department of Finance. I think he froze. John froze. But can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, good. Well, we're, we're I gaining solved my on technical it. difficulties. We're gaining on it. Well, I'll finish John's thought and while the he's... Oh, there he is. Okay, there he go is. ahead. Well, you froze for a moment, John. Start okay. that sentence again about what the, what the report showed from the Department of Finance. Uh, either the, the report showed that they got absolutely zero. So that's the same as it was last year as well. And sorry for freezing. I'm trying to get warmed up, but, I, you know, um, well, they, they, <laughs> they, 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 they got no money at all. And so this convoluted deal actually backfired on the part of a number of people who originally, um, uh, uh, originally supported it. So, again, no surprise. This is the law of unintended consequences when people uh, try to make law based on very little time and with no hearings, with no hearings. That's right. So the reason that they're getting no money is because the idea was that the state would take in extra revenue from these taxes. But what happens is when you get larger property taxes, you get larger property tax deductions from income tax. So they get less revenue from income tax. And so the formula will never produce any revenue. That's essentially what we're finding. This is two years in a row. It's produced nothing right. at all. And, and that's the reason. It's just, it was, a, it was a trick. The whole thing was a trick to try and raise your taxes while you were watching commercials about wildfire victims. And it was 2020. It was the pandemic. It was noisy. It was confusing. There was a lot going on. And it slipped through, just barely, it slipped through. So we feel very yeah. confident that we will be able to reverse this. I saw a question from Vaughn. Hi, Vaughn. I saw a question that said, why is the as estimate of how much this will supposedly cost so much higher than last time? And the answer is, we don't really know. They just did hypothetical math and they said that the losses from the loss of tax revenue by reversing this death tax uh, would, what's the phrase, the losses would grow over time, reaching 1.5 billion to 2 billion annually. Now we dispute those numbers, but even if it's true, let me ask you this, where did it say in Prop 19 that it was a $2 billion tax increase on people who have just lost their parents? Did they tell you that? I think not. So they either didn't tell you that because it's not true or it's true and we better look at it again and see if we really want to do that. If we really want to fund government on the backs of people who've just had a, a loss of that magnitude in their family. And now you have one year to figure out if you're going to move, drop everything and move into your parents' house. This has just been so, it's been so painful for so many families and so difficult. And it took effect very quickly. They finished counting the votes in December 2020. This took effect in the middle of February 2021 over the holidays, in the middle of a pandemic, with all the government offices closed, and people were just blindsided by this. It's been really bad. So we will come back to the rest of the questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Laura now that we have her microphone working. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Susan. Hi, John. Thank you so much for being patient with my technical difficulties. Um, so good evening. I am Laura Doherty. I am the Director of Legal Affairs for Howard Jarvis Taxpayers. So um, that means I'm the attorney in the office. And that means also that I don't have any, um, any news for you about repeal the death tax, but the cases I will share with you 
will show you why you need to sign those petitions and why this whole process that we're always gonna need to go through is so important. Um, I think we all know that the government is not the best listener. It does not listen um, to the voters or the taxpayers very well. Um, so the legal department is working very hard for you and we're happy to do so. It's a tough environment. Um, very generally right now, the courts are not super taxpayer friendly. And um, even with respect to your rights to pass legislation by initiative, we're noticing this horrible double standard, which is that um, if you would like to legislate taxes by initiative, if you'd like to say yes to taxes, the courts are very supportive. Um, but if you wanna do anything that says no to taxes, the courts are not so supportive. Um, so that's the theme we're seeing in the courts. So we have a lot going on. I'm just gonna list most of it for you and then talk about a couple of the highlights. We are defending Prop 13's two thirds vote on special taxes. This is very important. The short story of that is that the courts of appeal have been dismantling it since 2020, um, which came as a shock. We are defending Prop 13's ban on transfer taxes. Um, that is the Measure ULA case in Los Angeles. I'll, I'll give an update on that one. We are defending your right to vote on bonds. Um, specifically, we have three cases in different courts of appeal over pension obligation bonds. And this is kind of a cousin to um, the issue that John was talking about with ACA1. The principle of Prop 13 in this, these cases actually goes back to 1879 in the California constitution. There has been this two thirds voter approval requirement um, on these bonds and anything that exceeds the annual budget of a local government. So um, it just goes to show that taxpayer protection is not really even a brand new concept or a recent concept with Prop 13. We've, we've been working for, with it for forever and it's just good financial practice. We have been busy as well filing amicus briefs in the United States Supreme Court to defend you against a problem called home equity theft. The Supreme Court has decided that that is a taking. Um, what was going on, believe it or not, is there were many states across the country um, where those who suffered a tax foreclosure sale were also um, having the rest of their home equity taken by the government or by a non-government agency. Um, it's, you know, it's sad enough if, uh, let's say, you know, grandpa gets dementia and forgets to pay the property taxes and the house gets sold, but there are governments who were simply keeping the excess equity um, and saying they had a right to do that. So this was actually a question that had to go to the Supreme Court and they said, no, that's a taking you may not keep the home equity. And now we're in the aftermath of those cases where um, what's happening now is some governments do not want to pay back anyone for what they took. They just want the decision to be prospective and not retroactive. Um, so we'll actually be participating in that question as well in the next couple of months. Um, and, and this home equity issue is very important in California because while we don't have one of the more overt statutes that allows this taking, we have a more subtle sort of schematic set of statutes that need to go. So we're gonna stay on top of that and fight for you there. Last but not least is as John mentioned, um, just last week, we have become part of the legal team defending the Taxpayer Protection Act. Um, we, we do feel very strongly that you will see the Taxpayer Protection Act on the ballot next November. The lawsuit, um, I have it right here. I don't know if this can come up visibly on screen. If you just wanna see what it looks like. It's officially the legislature and the governor suing the secretary of state saying, take TPA off the ballot. So they're asking for you, the voters to not even have a chance to vote on it, which is very antithetical to the idea that we believe strongly in the initiative power here in California, right? When it's voting for taxes, the courts are in favor. When it's voting against, well, we don't know how the court's gonna rule on this. this. This is an emergency petition that was just filed in the Supreme Court by the legislature. 
which does not want you to have the chance to vote on the Taxpayer Protection Act. Um, so they filed it directly in the Supreme Court. It's a special procedure where the Supreme Court will have original jurisdiction. What does the lawsuit say? Um, it's essentially just a lot of alarm bells saying that, oh no, this is going to cause a government shutdown. We won't have enough money. Um, we're not gonna be able to run the government anymore. That's really what it is throughout. Um, but you know, we've actually heard this before, right? Prop 13 was challenged in court um, and it survived all kinds of challenges, no problem. And it was pretty comprehensive too. Um, I've heard that, well, I get the message through this petition as well that the legislature does not like the retroactivity provision. So the TPA does go back to January 1st, 2022 so that it can correct any errors. Um, but again, Prop 218 had retroactivity. So really not, not worried there. So um, I think what's really happening here and, and John described this as I'm sure is that the legislature just really doesn't like that the people want a right to vote on their state taxes. And for those of you who remember the gas tax increase in 2017, imagine if we could have voted on that, we probably would have defeated it. And the legislature just doesn't like that. So, so we've been working on, um, on all the defense this week and there's a lot to be done, but the first thing will be to argue simply that this is not, um, this is not appropriate to do before the election. We should be letting the voters decide this issue first. If there are any legal challenges in application later, that's appropriate. Um, you know, courts generally disfavor these pre-election um, challenges. Another thing to keep in mind, um, something we've discovered in our research is that this voter approval of state taxes is not unusual. There are at least four other states that already have that. And um, a couple of them did this in the early 90s during that second wave of the tax revolts that have happened. So it's really normal. I don't think the governments of Colorado or Oklahoma have shut down, right? And in fact, we just saw, um, you know, the, one of the arguments in the petition as well is that local governments are gonna be shutting down and they're gonna have trouble reversing things. Well, one question is how much would there really be to reverse and is it impossible? We just saw the city of Lodi um, reverse the tax that it was imposing and collecting because it realized that it didn't have voter approval. It, it had let the tax sunset back in 1998 um, following Prop 218 instead of holding an election and then it tried to revive it recently and it and with communication from HJTA and a member who alerted us that this was going on, we were able to have a conversation and the city of Lodi realized, okay, we cannot do this tax. We have to reverse it and refund. And I'm sure that will go smoothly. So other than the TPA, I think the most vital topic in the courts is the two thirds vote. I do have a little bit of news there. And as background, um, many of you probably know the two thirds vote itself is under attack in the courts of appeal. The two thirds vote originated in Prop 13. So that was 1978. And then it was updated with Prop 218 in 1996. And that's what really tacked it down was Prop 218. Made it very clear that all across the state, any local special tax needs two thirds approval. So we've been relying on this rule and it has been completely unquestioned for over 40 years. But in 2020, what the courts of appeal started to say, and this was based on a kind of ambiguous 2017 Supreme Court decision, is that if you take a special tax proposal and turn it into a voter initiative, then you do not need the two thirds approval. So, when they started making these rulings, what did politicians do? They, they copied their tax proposal into a voter initiative, ran a campaign and got it passed on simple majority. We challenged this in court and um, up until recently, the courts have been saying, well, that's actually just fine because politicians and citizens can collaborate and they do it all the time. 
But in August, we got this interesting decision out of San Diego. And this is over measure C from the March 2020 election, which has a lot of problems, by the way. There's a lot to this case. I'm not going to go into all of it. But there were problems with the tax itself, problems with the election. Um, but what's relevant for the two thirds vote, what's really interesting here is that it was also run by politicians in reality. And the court said, you know what? We need to remand this case back down to the trial court for depositions of city officials and find out if they were actually controlling the initiative because then it would not be a real initiative. And then it should require a two thirds vote to pass. So we were very happy to see that, you know, that's a huge step in the right direction for the courts to recognize that the politicians can hijack the initiative process and get around the two thirds vote. But above all, um, we really feel like it's just more proof of how absurd this is. What the voters intended when they passed Prop 13 and 218 was to have a two thirds vote on all local special taxes. That protects your budgets. I mean, it does a lot of different things. Um, it does so many things, but it, one thing it does is protect the general fund because the more special taxes you have, the less bandwidth you have for your general fund. So, so we really need to rise above this and just get to the point of recognizing what the voters actually wanted. It may not happen in the courts <laughs> at this point. We still hope the Supreme Court will take up the issue. It has not done so far. Uh, it might do it through the San Diego case, we're not sure. But meanwhile, we have the Taxpayer Protection Act designed to correct this. If you can vote for the Taxpayer Protection Act next fall, it will say that the two-thirds vote applies regardless of whether the vote is printed on a voter initiative or presented by your city council. So we're hoping to correct that. And I'd like to give a little shout out to Justice Kruger who wrote a dissent, a beautiful dissent, a partial concurrence and dissent in that 2017 Supreme Court decision. Um, if, if you ever need a nice reality check about what the voters really intended, just read her dissent. Um, she basically said a tax is a tax. It does not matter how it's presented. And surely the voters did not intend for there to be some difference based on how it's presented. But this is the insanity that's gone through the courts and this is what we're dealing with. So this is why we need the TPA. And, and by the way, don't believe it when you, you maybe get the impression from anyone that the TPA is going to so dramatically reduce government funding. Um, all it's doing is putting things back to the way they were only three years ago. So if there's any losses, those are just windfalls that the local governments weren't supposed to have anyway under what's being called upland taxes. If you hear the term upland tax, that just means anything that was passed after 2020 using these loopholes. Okay, so I promised I would um, go over the Measure ULA case. I'll try to keep it brief. I know legal stuff is boring. Um, Measure ULA is our transfer tax case. And what a transfer tax is, is a big cut of the price when you sell your house. So in Los Angeles, they recently passed a tax that went effective April 1st, which um, taxes transfers over $5 million. And it's a really big tax. It's either 4% or 5.5%. So Prop 13, again, we need to protect Prop 13. Prop 13 planning for this said no transfer taxes because Prop 13 was never meant to be just some sort of um, property tax deferment program for the government. You know, you were never supposed to cut a big check to the government when you sell your house and move to the next one. It's never how it was meant to be. Um, and, and the transfer tax ban has been upheld pretty well in the courts over the years. There were some clawbacks by the courts in the early 90s, um, but it, it's a pretty hard and fast rule. So, so now we need to defeat Measure ULA. So I'm hoping we defeat it in the court. Um, and if not, again, please support the Taxpayer Protection Act because that will, that will fix it too. And the hearing is coming up on October 23rd. That is in the trial court. So um, please stay tuned for how that decision comes out, but do remember that there will be an appeal either way. So. 
Um, it will not be the final word. We'll have to get the appeal going either way and see what the Court of Appeal finally decides. Um, so that's, that's my case update for now. There's really so much going on, but I think that's enough to share for now. Again, we are in this, um, I think we're in this third wave of, of tax revolts and the courts aren't real friendly right now. So that's why this, this repeal the death tax initiative is very important. We need you to sign those petitions and get them in because that is the way we're going to change the law. And thank you, uh, thank thank you, you so much for your support, everyone. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much. Something that I forgot to mention, and I see a question about someone whose taxes quadrupled in 2022 when a home was inherited. This is retroactive. Our measure is retroactive. So when it passes, I'm going to say when it passes, you will be able to get your original tax assessment reinstated as if the parent-child reassessment had not happened. So with the inflation adjustment year by year of 2%, you will be able to apply to have that previous Prop 13 protected assessment reinstated, which is really important because people are getting trapped in this. And it's awful to have to sell property because they're taxing you out of it. That's just horrible. There was a question about the assessors. We have found that the assessors are very supportive of this effort because they hate Prop 19. Uh, L.A. County Tax Assessor Jeffrey Prang called it a dumpster fire, Prop 19, that is, uh, causing so many problems. So he has supported the effort to repeal the death tax, and we're very grateful for that support. Uh, we had a question on what is the difference between a special tax and a fee? Laura, do you want to explain what defines a fee versus a tax? Sure, sure, no problem. Um, well, there was a proposition in 2010 that passed known as Prop 26, and that's another important taxpayer protection provision. It defined every charge by government as a tax, except for certain things. And those are fees. So there's a list of them in the constitution. Those are the only things that your state or local government can pass without getting voter approval. So the real difference is a tax requires voter approval. A fee does not. A fee is supposed to match um, the cost of whatever it's being charged for as well. So, so the big difference between a tax and a fee is when you pay a tax, you may not get anything for it. You're just, you're being taxed, you're paying into the system. A fee is supposed to be for something that's related to you. And again, it could be a local fee or a state fee. It's something you might pay to get a license or permits. Um, you might pay for an inspection of something. I mean, there's all kinds of things that qualify as as fees and they have to be related to something that you are engaged in. So, okay. so that's the difference. <laughs> have we heard of a luxury tax if you sell a home that's more than $2 million in SJ? I guess that was at San Jose, San Joaquin. I'm not sure is, have we heard about a luxury tax if you sell a home, does that happen? Well, I isn't that kind of, it, John? yeah, isn't, isn't that kind of what ULA is. It's not a luxury tax. They called it a mansion tax, right. even though it was on all property more than $4 million. Now, that includes every apartment building out there. So again, the problem with these real estate transfer taxes, they're starting out at high value property, thinking that most people won't object. But as we've seen with other taxes, they start small and then they grow. So you can bet your bottom dollar that if they get away with these massive increases in real estate transfer taxes, that they're going to lower the threshold over time so that every single property that's sold will have to pay a higher real estate transfer tax. And this has been our nightmare. This has been what we predicted for about 30 years. I've often thought that the progressives, the tax and spend lobby, would use real estate transfer taxes as a means to recapture all the money that taxpayers save because of Proposition 13. The money that taxpayers save because of Proposition 13 is money that the government thinks that they've, that they've lost. So this is the real estate transfer taxes at four or five, 10 percent is good. It could be designed in a manner to recapture all the money you've saved because of, of uh, Proposition 13 and that limitation on annual increases in assessed valuation. So this is very, very dangerous. Again, very important that Laura get all the support she need, needs for the, um, our litigation, the ULA case, 
and also support for the Taxpayer Protection Act. And if I could, Susan, I'd like to just talk just briefly about our entities. Uh, Laura is supported, uh, her, her compensation comes from the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Foundation. That is a 501c3 organization. Donations into the C3 are tax deductible, but because the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association is a 501c4, we do a lot of political work. So those contributions are not tax deductible. We also have political action committees and we are fighting for the Taxpayer Protection Act through our, one of our initiative committees called Protect Proposition 13, a project of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So I, I explain all this only to let you know that as, as evidence of the fact that we fight in all these realms, whether we support candidates, whether we support initiatives, whether we support litigation, whether we support communication efforts, uh, it, it's very important that one way or another you stay engaged in the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Absolutely. We have political committees, which are regulated by the state of California under campaign finance law. We have the foundation, which is regulated by the IRS as a, as a nonprofit. And we have our association, which is our main entity, which is also under the IRS code as a nonprofit. But it's a C4. It's a 501C4, which is a little different. If you want to make a tax deductible contribution, donate to the foundation because that's a 501c3. And you can find all this information on our website at hjta.org. All of our entities and everything that we do. So I just saw a question fly by that said, how do you sign the petition? Go to repealthedeathtax.com, repealthedeathtax.com and download the petition. Click the button that says download the petition and you'll get our PDF. This is the petition. It's the last page of a five-page PDF, which includes complete instructions and a mailing label that you can cut out and tape to an envelope. Very simple. You just write in the county, write in your printed name, your signature, your street address, your city and zip, and then fill out the declaration of circulator at the bottom, which says that you're attesting that you are the person you say you are, and then that makes it valid. Uh, are we getting a lot back with errors was one of the questions. Well, not more than you would get normally. I think there's usually when you pay signature gatherers about a 30% rate of invalidity. It's pretty typical. Uh, ours, is, ours is less. Uh, we think we're getting 15 to 20% back that need to go back for revisions and fixes, but we're sending them back for revisions and fixes. And if you live in the Sacramento area and you'd like to volunteer and come in and help us with the mail, that'd be great because we are getting... We are getting snowed in. It's blizzard conditions every time the mail comes, which is all good news, but it's a lot of paper. And, and we're all doing this in addition to our regular jobs. So it's a lot. Uh, what else did I see here? Oh, I have a legislative update for you. Our legislative director, Scott Kaufman, is away tonight. However, he wanted me to let you know that SB 520 has passed and it's sitting on the governor's desk for his signature. This makes it clear that if a family member, if a parent moves into a care facility, like a nursing home or a, a long-term care facility, they do not lose their homeowner's exemption. So that if someone passes away at another address, it does not matter. So that you will continue to have that homeowner's exemption and you'll be able to move into that house and have the protection of what, what protection there is in Prop 19, which isn't much, but it's something. So, um, that's important. The governor hasn't signed it yet, but that's SB 520 from our good friend, Senator Kelly Sayarto. And we're hopeful that the governor will sign that. Many of the assessor's offices have been doing this anyway. They've been keeping the homeowner's exemption for people who are temporarily incapacitated and living in a care facility. So you can check with the assessor's office in your county if you're in that unfortunate situation. But SB 520 will clarify that law. And I saw a question go by, how do we convince people who hate Prop 13 to sign this? First of all, we have to get a million signatures, but we don't have to get them from people who hate Prop 13. There's plenty of people who don't hate Prop 13. So say thank you, have a nice day and move on. However, if you, are, if you insist on trying to convince someone, here's what you should do. Go to the Guessing Game Calculator at guessinggame.org guessinggame.org and show everybody who owns property in California what their taxes would be if Proposition 13 had never passed. Because before Prop 13, property taxes were based on the market value of your home every year and the statewide average tax rate was 2.67%. 
Prop 13 cut it to 1% statewide. But imagine paying 2.67% of the current market value of your home every year as a condition of keeping it. People would lose their property all day long, and that's what was happening in the 1970s, and that's what would happen again. So go to guessinggame.org. You can also get there from the Howard Jarvis homepage at hjta.org. Push the button that says, see your shocking tax bill if we lost Prop 13. And type in, all you have to do is type in the estimated current market value of the property and push the button, and it will do the math for you to show you what you would be paying if the rules were still the same as they were in 1977 before Prop 13 passed. So this is a really important taxpayer protection. Even if you bought your home just a couple of years ago, you are protected by Prop 13 from having the taxes go up with the market value, and you're protected by that lower tax rate and by the two-thirds protection and the other things that are in there that we're fighting so hard to either support, protect, reinstate. We're fighting in the courts to stop them from eroding your taxpayer protections. And we're doing such a good job that now the governor and the legislature are suing to have the Taxpayer Protection Act taken off the ballot. So much democracy. They want it taken off the ballot before you have a chance to vote on it. They can't argue with it. They can't defeat it. So they want to just get it legally rejected from the ballot. And we're going to fight that because we don't think that's we don't think that's accurate. Uh, why did legislators vote to put Prop 19 on the on the ballot in the first place? That's a really good question. There was a deal in Sacramento. There were uh, powerful special interests that wanted that on the ballot. There was a deal. And um, I think a lot of them did not understand the full impact of what this tax increase would do to people. I don't think they understood what it would do to tenants and affordable housing. I don't think they understood what it would do to small businesses, um, but they know now. And we hope that they get on board and support us in this effort. And you can call your representatives. They're not in session right now, but you can still call their offices or you can call their district offices. You can look them up at findyourrep dot legislature dot ca dot gov find your rep dot legislature dot ca dot gov tell them this matters to you and you think they should support it and did i miss any more questions let's see ah uh, well we have nice notes that somebody loves us and is happy that they found us. Well, thank you. And spread the word. Spread the word that everyone should be a member of this great organization, hjta.org, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, named for the guy who put Prop 13 on the ballot, took five tries to get that on the ballot. He and many other important volunteers who fought like nine people in a living room with a fax machine, grassroots politics, to get this on the ballot. And that's what we're going to do with this. We're going to do grassroots politics. We don't need a fax machine. Fortunately, we have the internet. It's a little faster than a fax machine. And we are going to get the word out as far and wide as we can with your help to tell everyone what this is about and how easy it is to download and sign the petition and send it back to us. It's really important. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention, there was a question earlier about who writes these titles and summaries and how tricky they are and the fact that the repeal of the gas tax was a bait and switch where yes seemed like no and no seemed like yes. One of the things that really needs doing in this state is to take the responsibility for writing titles and summaries away from the elected partisan attorney general. Because as a politician, as a person who's going to run for office with all the alliances that politicians have, there's kind of an incentive to put a thumb on the scale against taxpayers and for measures that raise taxes. And I'm sure that many of them have tried to be fair, but try only goes so far. We would like to have the titles and summaries written by the legislative analyst's office. They're more neutral and, um, and they don't put a thumb on the scale. And that will require a constitutional amendment. So that's kind of something we can put on our things to do list. After we do this, we can look at doing that because it's been proposed in the legislature, but the legislature leaves it alone. They, they like it this way. And as John said earlier, the courts have been kind of gracious to the attorney general and, and given them a lot of leeway to um, put a thumb on the scale. We Susan, don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a question there about uh, what, do you, what does somebody say to somebody who contends that Prop 13 has hurt education in the state of California? 
let's put all this in context and why HJTA does what it does. California is a heavily taxed state. We have the highest income tax rate in America at 13.3%. We have the highest state sales tax rate in America. We have the highest gas tax in America. And it's tax and tax, and we don't get the services we're paying for. When it comes to education, per pupil spending on an inflation-adjusted basis is much higher now than it was in the mid-70s before Prop 13 passed. Uh, back in the mid-70s, education, everybody, uh, uh, liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, agreed that California education was some of the best in America. And now we're spending at least 30% more on a per student inflation adjusted basis and our education system is broken beyond belief, but it's broken for reasons having nothing to do with money. In fact, the head of this California Teachers Association in their recent newsletter to their members was bragging that they've tripled per pupil spending and they were laughing about it. And yet the schools continue to fail the students. Regrettably, education in the state of California is run for special interests, not for the children or the parents. And things, there are a lot of things that's a whole separate discussion that we can save for another day, but it's not lack of money. Prop 13 is the only restraint on taxation in the state of California. I also noticed today that there was an article about the state of Iowa where I, where I went to high school. Iowa is ratcheting down all its taxes and moving its income tax rate down to zero and yet their economy is booming. And so the economic figures that we're seeing, California is slowing down, has actually lost gross domestic product, while other states who have reduced taxes, particularly those states that have eliminated their income taxes, are booming. So this tells you why HJTA does this. We're not anti-government, we're just anti-bad government, and we want reasonable taxation and intelligent fiscal decisions. Absolutely. I saw a question asking if we have a 30 second elevator pitch. Yes, we do. This is the flyer that is included in the PDF when you download the petition. This is on page three of the PDF. And it's exactly that. It says parents should be able to transfer their home and limited other property to their children without triggering reassessment and a huge tax increase. Here's your elevator pitch. We think voters were tricked into removing it when they passed Prop 19. Families benefit from this measure because the death of a parent won't trigger an unaffordable tax hike on family property, and renters benefit because the, the death of a mom and pop landlord will not trigger reassessment of the building and huge cost increases that make the business unviable. So for all those reasons, and you can have this, you can print out as many of these as you like, you can print as many of the petitions as you like, you can take it to a Staples or an Office Depot or anywhere and, and get copies made. If you get copies made, just be sure that the one inch margin at the top is preserved. That's what you want. Everything else will take care of itself in terms of the font size and all the rest of it. A one inch margin at the top. And we are looking forward to having a million plus signatures pouring into our office. Well, I guess we can't say we're looking for Some of the people in our office are not looking forward to having a million pieces of paper land on their desks, but this is really important. And if we can do this, then we can do a lot of things in California to fix problems that people are suffering from because it's been very expensive to get things on the ballot. And this is an effort to try something new to do it. And we thank you all for being part of this important effort because it could be historic and we greatly appreciate your participation and your support in this. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, John, for any final words. I think that pretty much covers it again. Really appreciate all your support and participating in this webinar. Webinar. We'll do these quarterlies and give you an update on repeal the death tax, the outcome of the ULA case. And uh, again, um, Howard Jarvis uh, uh, made it clear. He had a, my, one of his favorite sayings of mine is, um, uh, you know, a, a, a ship does not sail on yesterday's wind meaning we have to keep constant pressure on government to, to, uh, to toe the line and do things legally and not abuse their power. Go to hjta.org. If you're not already a member of this great organization, please join. 
and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.